fireworks. I remember a couple of years ago, I was sitting on the roof of a boat. Well, I was on the top deck of a boat. And I was out, and on one side to the left of me was New Jersey. And on the other side to the right of me was Manhattan Island and the Brooklyn Bridge and the Freedom Tower and Lady Liberty and Ellis Island. And I'm out there, and I'm just waiting. And the anticipation starts to rise. And I don't know about you, but every 4th of July, it becomes mushy to me because I cry a lot when the fireworks start going off. There's something about fireworks that just move me to a sense of emotion. I think they're so beautiful, and I'm in awe of them. But this particular 4th of July was incredibly special because there I was on, on this top deck, and the fireworks started going off. And just in true American fashion, there had to be competition. So New Jersey wasn't really sure when they were going to set theirs off. And New York wasn't really sure. We heard on the news that day they had set times, but they, each one of them wanted to have the bigger shows. You know? And each one of them, I mean, each one of them were quite incredible. So as soon as Manhattan started setting them off and you started to see them over, and, and the Freedom Tower is just all glass and you're seeing multiple pieces of fireworks everywhere in the sky and over the bridge and, and it reflected in the glass and you look over and New Jersey's like, oh yeah, I see what you I see what you got. And I'll raise you some. And then New Jersey starts to blow them off and you see them over Lady Liberty and you see them over Ellis Island and I'm just done. I was toast. I could hardly see the fireworks show through all of my tears. I was so moved because I was raised in a very patriotic family. We love our country, but also because when I looked to the left, I realized in that moment, my family came in there. They came in on a boat many years ago and floated in, and they saw Lady Liberty, something I think we take for granted, and it really meant freedom to them in the sacrifices they made. And on the boat over, they children were lost because that happened. And you didn't get to take those bodies with you into Ellis Island. They had to go overboard in potato sacks. What were you willing to risk for freedom? They weren't just thinking of their themselves. They weren't just thinking of their generation. No, they were thinking about generations to come. They were thinking about families that would come down many, many years after they were gone. They were thinking of hope and promise and opportunity. And they came in and they saw Lady Liberty. And it meant they made it. Not that the fight was over, not that the journey of the quest was over, not by any shot, but that freedom wasn't that far away. And they pulled up and they had to walk through Ellis Island and they had to be checked and one of them had to stay quarantined for a while and they hoped that they would get better. And of course we were German and at the time they came, Germans weren't very popular in this country. And so they had to change the way they pronounced their last names. My last name is pronounced differently actually. But it's pretty American now. That's what they had to do, and they were segregated to their own little German borough, just like the Italians and the Irish and everybody else. And they were separated off to the side, and they stood in work lines just hoping to feed the kids a piece of bread, and that to them was cherished freedom. That to them was the opportunity they fought for. That to them is what they stood and gave thanks for. And one day they would put all these pieces together and they would save up enough and they would head, I don't know why, but they would head to South Dakota. <laughs> but everybody planned in the free, right? I'm like, what is the matter with you guys? You were in New York, you went to South Dakota? <laughs> Different generational values. But they were German farmers. Their trade was working the land. Their trade was not being machinists or working in industry. Their trade was not white collar business or banking or anything else. Their trade was sowing seeds and reaping harvest. Their trade was feeding people. Their trade was basically early legalized gambling, otherwise known as farming. 
And that's what they did. That's what they came here to do, to somehow face South Dakota winters. That was freedom. It was freedom to them. And they didn't know who we would be or my parents would be, but they came anyway to give us the chance to do the things that we call freedom. There is no word, I don't think, in the English language that is as powerful and as motivating as the word freedom. People have been willing to die for freedom. People have died for freedom. People have been willing to sacrifice the oceans to take risks that could cost the lives of their children on a chance for freedom. Even today, in our country and in countries around the world, people are fighting for a chance at freedom. And we here in this country of freedoms, we take for granted. And we take our freedoms and use them against other people. And the thing about Jesus was that he taught us, Christian brothers and sisters, that our freedom is not for us. Our freedom is so that we are free for others. In the men and women who served the military, freedom has meant something a bit more to them. It had a cost. It had a price. They saw brothers and sisters, lives lost. They left behind families. For us, they didn't know us. They left behind families that they were fighting for, for the chance of that same freedom. And there are many of them are not around today for my generation and the generations after me to thank. They're not readily available. The greatest generation is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And the stories, they're hard to share. So much of our story as Christianity is in the world tradition. And what happens if we don't share our stories? If we don't pass down to the generations of our family why freedom meant something to us? And what it means to feel purpose and passion, a sense of duty and care and honor. Those are sacrifices. Many of us, not just my generation, so we don't get all the bad rap, but many of us take for granted and feel entitled to. There's a TED Talk that's out that I think is really powerful, and I recently came across it. I'm going to look up the gentleman's name because I want to make sure I get it right. Johan Hari. And I'll post it on our Facebook page so you can go and look, but I'm basically going to tell you what he's talking about. He's talking about addiction. And Johan is talking about how we have lots of different thoughts in our, in our country and in the world about addiction, what causes addiction, why people stay in addiction. And, and he tells the story about scientists doing, uh, having their lab rats. And he said they, they were doing these tests and they would set a rat inside a cage and one of the bottles was pure water. And the other, other bottle was water with was cocaine water. And, and they noticed that time after time after time, when given a choice, the rats would go towards the cocaine water. And they would almost inevitably, every time, overdose. They would just more and more and more. Well, in the 1970s, a psychology professor from Vancouver said, oh, we need to retry this. Because the thing about those cages is those rats are completely alone. They're completely isolated. And the only option for life they have is pure water or cocaine water. So they, he made something they call Rat Park. And Rat Park was essentially, you know, um, the four seasons for rats. Uh, and in Rat Park, you had your water and you had your cocaine water. You also had all the cheese you could want. You had colorful balls to play with, more space. You had friends in your cage. You could hang out with your friends. You could make with your friends. See all the wonderful things you get in freedom, right? So all of these things. And they noticed the rats didn't turn to the cocaine water. And if they did, 
It was briefly just to figure out what was in that bottle, and they didn't go back. What they discovered was that in isolation, we are more apt to be involved in forms of addictive behavior when we are isolated. But when we have a community of friends, when we have relationship, when we have love, we make other choices, different choices. This was the study they found. Well, there were some people in Portugal who then decided they were going to test this in a larger field. So in Portugal, just like here, there was a lot of people who were incarcerated for drug-related uh, crimes, and just drug use in general. So what they did is they decided they would try an experiment, and they took all of the money. They said, okay, well, we're going to take that, and said we're going to decriminalize this, and we're going to find a way to put them in community instead of isolate them. We're going to build a workforce that helps them have jobs. We're going to give them opportunity to succeed and thrive in the world. And we're going to give them a support network. And over the course of a couple years in Portugal, they noticed that drug and addiction related crimes were down 50%. Down 50%. They noticed that HIV related to drug use was down. They noticed that crime related to drug use was down. They noticed that families and the hurt and brokenness in families related to drug use and addiction was down. And what they discovered in all of that is that it's not sobriety that the addict needs more than anything else. It's community. Community is that connective tissue that then makes sobriety and thriving and life a little bit more possible. And what Johan suggested was that maybe it's not the addiction so much that we need to focus on as it is our cage. That so often we put ourselves in cages or the world through circumstance has surrounded us in a cage and we don't know how to get out. And we are isolated from support systems. We are isolated from love and we don't believe that we're anything but alone. So addiction and those kind of behaviors come out of a sense of feeling completely abandoned, a sense of feeling alone. We have mental health situations in our country, around the world, that need to be addressed. But our addictions have increased. Our addictions to Amazon, myself included. Our addictions to food, our addictions to exercise. Our addictions to social media and our telephones, our addiction to drugs and alcohol, our addiction to a number of things. How about our addiction to negativity? We're addicted to that, actually. How about our, our addiction to work? Anybody want to address that? It's become something that we glorify as, is overworking or being a workaholic. We glorify, oh, you work so many hours, you're just no, I'm tired. I'm tired, that's what I am. I'm not marvelous. I'm exhausted. But we glorify the wrong things. And how free are we? Or is freedom an illusion we don't understand anymore? The scripture in 2 Samuel, when read in the message version, is really powerful because it is a psalm of thanksgiving for God's salvation in one's life. And he's talking about how he felt alone. He felt isolated. He had been hated. His enemies were just pounding down on him. He couldn't catch a break. Not from employers, not from work, not from credit companies, not from the bank, not from the kids, not from, you know, everything that bears down on us and wears us out. That sense of feeling like we're not good enough, we're not lovable. God can't possibly forgive our sins. When we turn that bitterness and that hurt and it becomes anger and it festers out and then we start hurting other people. Hurt people hurt people. We have a world of people addicted to their hurt because it's a lot easier to sit and hurt and be mad at the world than it is to face your hurt. 
to walk through that, to deal with that. It's a lot easier for us to judge people than it is to grab them by the hand and actually sit with them and walk with them and love them. See, that takes time. That takes dedication. That takes commitment. And none of us want to do that. But we sure do want to complain. That's the cage we're in. And the scripture says that God burst through the sky like a grand comet of fireworks. Then God thundered out of heaven and the secret sources of the ocean were exposed. The hidden depths of the earth lay uncovered the moment God roared in protest. Brothers and sisters, God is roaring in protest to our cages today. The cages we refuse to leave. Why does the caged bird sing? And the cages we put others in. Literally and figuratively. And then the words of the scripture says, But he caught me. But he caught me. There I was in the midst of all this mess, and then God sent fireworks across the sky, and he caught me. He reached all the way from sky to sea. He pulled me out of the ocean of hate. That enemy chaos, the void in which I was drowning. Our judgments, our criticisms, our opinions, they don't help anybody. That judgment is never, ever going to help an addict. The judgments of people in church to keep people from coming to church or make people feel like they need to leave church, that's not going to bring anybody to Jesus. <laughs> you can't hate anybody into heaven. Like, have we figured that out yet? I mean, we really haven't. When Jesus came, he didn't spend all of his time hanging out in the temple with the super religious people. Maybe it's because Jesus was like, mm, they're stubborn in there. If you're not sure what that's like, come serve a week as pastor. <laughs> Every church, everywhere. Where did he go? He didn't worry about going there. Maybe Jesus didn't think that they'd get it. Instead, he went to the streets. He went to the eunuch. He went to the poor. He went to the prostitute. He went to the adulterer. He went to the tax collector and the thief and the liar. He went to the addict. And he said, you matter. And he gave that ministry of presence because he sat with them. He understood the cages that exist in this world. And he broke open those cage doors and said, now you've got to walk out. But I am right here with you. You are not alone. He came down and caught people in the nets, in his love, in his arms, in his passion. In his radical difference from every other way we practice religion. And he pulled them out of an ocean of hate. I once had a pastor who said, think of it this way. If you were unclean or somebody was judging you, and, and I know that many people feel this way because they tell me, Pastor, I, that's nice, but I love Jesus. I'm not going back to any church ever. Because I got pregnant as a teenager and I was told how awful I was and I never set me back foot in a church. Because those people don't know Jesus, they just know hate. What about I'm the immigrant and pastor, they don't want me in their country. Or I'm the teen who got addicted and you want to hate on my parents. I made a mistake. I got, I got stuck in something. And the pastor said it's like walking down the aisles of the church and everybody in the sanctuary screaming out, unclean, unclean, unclean. That's what they had to do in biblical times. Us, that's even qualifies each one of us because we're all sinners. So I don't need to dig in your closet to know that you are not perfect. And so each one of us would come into the church. So how comfortable would you be if I walked down this aisle and you scream at me, unclean? Unworthy. Would you be comfortable with that? Then why do you do it on Facebook? And I'm not saying you do that to me, but generally, why do we do that? Why do people feel like they can't be here? Unclean, unclean, unclean. You're not worthy. You're not good enough. Oh, you made a mistake. Why do we have perfection? 
perfectionism issues. That's another addiction. Pleasing people is an addiction. I'm giving that one up. <coughs> Why? Why? Why do we look at people's families and say, your family looks different than mine, so unclean? Or you love differently than me, so unclean? You know where Jesus was? Where are the unclean people? Those are my people. Where are the misfits and the sinners? Those are my people. You find me the addict, you find me Jesus. That is exactly where Jesus is. Where is the immigrant, the poor, the hurting, the person dying of cancer, the person holding their baby in their arms? That's where Jesus is. You find me the pride parade, and that's where Jesus is. Why? Because that's where God's people are. God scooped us up and caught us. And then he said, I stood there saved. Saved. I was, I was safe. I was out of my cage. Nobody was calling me names anymore. Nobody was shutting me out. I didn't feel alone. I didn't feel like I needed to die because the world would be better off. No, I stood there saved. Safe in the arms of Christ, and the scripture says, I was surprised to be loved. There's a woman going around, and she's going to have a movie now played by, um, oh shoot, it's not Sigourney Weaver. Who's the Halloween lady? Jamie Lee Curtis. Thank you. So weird that that was my reference. <laughs> but, <laughs> Jamie, see, now don't judge me. But Jamie Lee Curtis is going to be starring this woman in a movie, and she's starring in the movie of a mother out of Oklahoma City who decided that she would walk around with a t-shirt and a button that said, Free Mom Hugs. Maybe you've seen this. It doesn't take our opinions to change the fact that we can love someone with their differences, with our differences. She knew what it was like to have a son broken and beat down. She knew what it was like to feel like she wasn't wanted in her church. In fact, told she wasn't wanted in her church. And she stepped out in the streets and she found people's children. She found God's children at pride parades and other events. And she went out into the aisles and she said, I will give you a hug. And you know how many people cry? You go without a hug. You go without a hug. You go without your mom and dad telling you that they love you. You do that. Maybe you have. And the power of a hug. That's what Jesus did. He walked to the AIDS victims in the 80s and he dared to touch them when nobody else would. Through the face of an angel nurse who served so many and buried so many in her own plot with her own money because nobody would touch them. And she did. And I know that that's controversial. Well, so is Jesus. Open the book. It's real saucy in there. And I know it's hard for us to face the hard issues and to face the difficult topics. And all I'm asking you to do is be willing to look on the right side and see God's glory. And be willing to look on the left side and see God's glory. To be willing to see the fireworks and understand that was freedom many of us have not fought for. And that the salvation that's in the scripture was not something we earned. It's God's grace freely given to everybody. Everybody. Who are we? People of freedom. People of God's grace and salvation. To tell anybody that freedom's not for them. Looking out, seeing the fireworks over Ellis Island, and knowing the sacrifices. On fire. They made sacrifices I didn't have to, so that I could have an education, and I could have an opportunity, and I could raise a family. They didn't see the fireworks the day they came in. 
but they knew that they would exist. John Adams, in the back of your bulletin by the benediction, he has a quote, and he was quoted as saying on the night when independence broke free through our nation, not for everybody, of course, but on the night that it broke across our nation, he had made a statement about how these fireworks would illumine the sky forevermore in memory and celebration of freedom. And every year, we pull out the grill and the burgers and the Johnsonville brats. <laughs> and we pull out our watermelon and we pull out the cupcakes and the cookies and the sprinklers and the pools and we grab a hold of our family and we look in awe. Some of us, of course, are the ones who are a little bit more pyros and we're setting off all the fireworks. And we celebrate that we live in a country that means freedom. But as Christians, it's more than being patriotic and more than nationalism. It runs so much deeper. This year, I hope when you look at the fireworks, you see God's glory. I hope you see God's face. I hope you see God's glory and you think about all of God's children. And I hope that you sit there in awe. Because that thing called freedom is something that every person hungers for. Every race, every nationality, every identity, every language, everybody understands freedom. But for us, we understand it as God's grace.